It is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for our next panel, uh, someone who I've just had such a great time getting to know, uh, Dr. Will Lee. Uh, Will is not only um, a doctor, he's not only this co the founder and the CEO of the Angiogenesis Foundation, but he's also a New York Times bestselling author of the book Eat to Beat Disease. I have read it. I've given that book to several people I know, including my father, getting to Alex's first panel on caregiving. Uh, I gave it to my father and, and my stepmother to make sure that they're, they're healthy. Um, and so, Will, we're just so glad to, to have you here with us. You were also recently on, on uh, Kelly Ripa's show, and so you've been making the, the tour on TV. And we're just, we're just so thrilled that you've got time to be with us today. I know you're going to moderate a great panel. And um, we're going to start transitioning into the view of industry. Um, which is going to be really exciting today. Our big industry startups, and of course, continuing with our very important research uh, voice in all these panels. So, Will, with that, take it away, my friend. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Katie. I also want to thank uh, the Friedman School uh, and the Food Nutrition Innovation Institute. What a um, what a privilege it is for us to be able to uh, gather together, but also very timely to be able to discuss on the heels of a discussion about information, disinformation, uh, misinformation, the whole topic of this session is really about evidence-based standards for innovations, because all, we all want to actually um, uh, come up with the next big thing that's gonna change our world, but how do we do that uh, with something really critical, which is trust? And what do we actually need from a standards perspective so that people can trust what is actually being uh, discussed? I'm here with uh, three uh, outstanding panelists. Um, I'll, I'll ask them to briefly introduce themselves um, uh, before we get into questions. So um, uh, my first, uh, our first uh, panelist is actually uh, Park Wildey uh, from Tufts University, uh, 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 Tristan Bribois uh, from PepsiCo and Josh Stevens from day two. Um, Park, do you want to get started and just uh, uh, say a little bit about yourself and um, what we're, we're going to try to do, I'll, I'll actually put the, throw the question out there so you can introduce yourself and dive into the question. Here, there's a problem and a solution. And, and, the, and the problem really is that our, the consumer doesn't know what to trust. And so the default for not knowing is actually to mis mistrust. So, I mean, some people will, will fall for anything, hook, line, and sinker, but I think what we've done now is really kind of gotten into this sort of um, epicenter where most people are not sure what to trust. And so we want to actually figure out how do we remedy that and what kind of evidence is actually going to help remedy um, mistrust? What do we need to present to people? So um, I'll ask each of you, but when we'll start, and you can introduce yourself briefly. So um, Park, take it away. So I, um, it's great to participate in this panel. I'm, I'm a professor here at the Friedman School and I teach a class on US food policy and have a textbook on the topic. And after all these years of focus on what makes the market for nutrition information work in the United States, I find myself fairly optimistic that some of the key messages are not really all that complicated. The dietary guidelines and the my plate graphic have straightforward messages suitable for a broad population. Um, it includes tools like how to shop simple with my plate. You know, these are mostly just regular generic food options that you can get into in a, any supermarket. And I think the source of the mistrust may be misleading messages from manufacturers or sellers of high processed branded foods, beverages, and dietary supplements. These messages try to take your attention away from the features of the products that they maybe don't want you to focus on, like if it's high in sodium or high in um, added sugars, and kind of focuses your attention towards nutritional features that consumers may be sort of vaguely aware of and have the sense that they're healthy, but don't really understand the details of, like contains lots of antioxidants or enhances athletic performance. There's a deep economic reason why the simpler healthy foods have trouble competing against the misleading messages. Regular foods operate in competitive markets that have a low incentive to advertise. Think, for example, about how much advertising do you see for tap water compared to you know, uh, beverages with electrolytes? Or how much advertising do you see for 
just generic cereal compared to cereal that's being marketed with a particular branded health feature. Um, the more processed branded foods and beverages have a stronger incentive to advertise and ordinary food sometimes gets crowded out. In the journal Public Health Nutrition, I've got a recent article with my colleague here at Tufts, Fang Fang Zhang and Jennifer Pomerantz, who you heard earlier at New York University, and others who were studying the consumer confusion about whole grain content, for example. We did side-by-side -side comparisons of products, one of which um, had more whole grain content. And the other one had some of those messages that you see that kind of imply whole grain content without really meaning it exactly. And we found that about 30 to 45% of consumers were misled and chose the wrong one, depending on the specific label. So the remedy may be for both consumers and policymakers to focus on the more traditional messages, on simple broad messages that have significant scientific agreement and ignore a whole lot of the noise in the marketplace. That is uh, uh, such a uh, well-grounded uh, perspective. Simple foods don't need a lot of uh, dressing to be able to actually market them, whereas actually more complex foods and processed foods actually do. Um, you know, here we are talking about innovation and how do we actually get evidence to go uh, to innovators. And we want to be able to reward people who are actually doing the innovations, regardless of whether it's simple or more complex. So here we actually have um, uh, Tristan, if you want to introduce yourself um, and provide maybe an industry perspective uh, on this topic. Um, how do we actually uh, address and, and cure this idea of consumer mistrust? Sure, thank you. Well, <clears throat> so Tristan Brisbois, I'm with uh, PepsiCo in the Life Sciences Department. Um, and you know, maybe just to build on some of uh, Park's comments, um, I completely agree that the easiest way to avoid misinformation is to have a simple and consistent message. Um, in nutrition science, I mean, we've had a bit of a rough ride, right, where there's been uh, science is constantly evolving, and that's leading to changes in messages. So <clears throat> one day fat is bad, and now it's good, and that certain types of fats and then now we're even more nuanced, right, with individual variations um, in the way that we metabolize nutrients. And that has led to the, the birth of personalized nutrition, which is an incredibly interesting field, but has also led to really um, massive consumer confusion around what they think is, is, is good for them. And so, you know, if we, if we think about a very simplistic message, we still have to remember the consumer and their needs and preferences. And so, you know, even a very simple message around eat more vegetables. I think we can all agree as a, as a collective that that is a good simple message. It builds on the previous comments around, you know, whole foods, etc. cetera. Um, but when you think about the consumer, you know, for them, taste is king. And that's followed by price and then convenience and then nutrition. And so, you know, even though that's a very simple message, um, it, sometimes if, if people don't like the vegetables, if they find them too expensive, maybe they're not accessible or they don't know how to prepare them, then that message isn't really viable. Uh, and so, you know, there just needs to be a bit of awareness and acknowledgement of the consumers and that they're making trade-offs constantly. And, and we need to work as a collective. And so these types of panels where you have policymakers and industry and academics together, that's fantastic because we need to have some core principles that we can all tout and keeping the consumer in mind but also being very aware of different emerging areas that might lead into potential um, mistrust of, of consumers and just making sure that we do have a consistent message, but still keeping the consumer uh, at the forefront. Well, that's, you know, th that's really refreshing to hear. And I love the fact that your background, Tristan, is in nutrition science. Uh, I'm somebody that's also worked in the biotechnology and biopharmaceutical world, where there's a lot of regulations about what you, what you can and can't say. And yet, in order to innovate, you need to be able to open the gates for people to be able to come up with the innovations uh, that actually will have a, a, a sort of a, a extended narrative to those basic messages. So, um, you know, large companies always uh, uh, have to do the heavy lifting of their legacy, their heritage, and the long memory that consumers actually have usually good memories, which is why they've been around so long. Sometimes there's, you know, conflicting information that comes out. 
But next, our next panelist is Josh Stevens, who's actually an innovator with a small company doing something really daring and audacious. And so when you're brand new, you know, you're just hatched out of the shell. Um, how do you, uh, Josh, think about developing uh, evidence to be able to address, how do we actually cure consumer mistrust when you are brand spanking new? So please introduce yourself and, and give us your point of view. Uh, Josh Stevens, I'm a president of Day2, which is a microbiome uh, science company, um, and we use microbiome profiling to provide personal nutrition and nutrition therapy for patients, um, now about 70,000 patients uh, nationwide. And I, I think that there's a, to build on something that was said, there's the challenge when it comes to building trust, Nutrition is a very funny area. In some ways, microbiome is a funny area too, because both areas are rife with um, conflicting information and misinformation. And probably no bigger nail in the coffin was when a recent president said, I'm president of the United States. I don't like broccoli. I don't have to eat my broccoli. And uh, that's a nonpartisan statement. That's just, uh, there's a lot of even leadership issues around whole foods uh, that are in our lifetime. The the challenge with personalized nutrition, which is our application, is that every year there's a new diet. There's a low salt diet, there's a low fat diet, there's a low carb diet, there's a keto approach, there's a paleo approach, there was an Atkins approach, uh, then there's a grapefruit approach. Which one's right? Most of them are commercially driven and non-scientific. In addition, the food pyramid changes and gets distorted. In addition, labeling as good as it is, is distorted when you read the portion on a bag of processed food is an, a reasonable amount of calories, fat, protein, and carbs. But then the fine print, it says bag contains 10 servings. That's what's often missed. And so there's a lot of, there's reform opportunity for sure to build on the good work that's been done. But we would also offer that there's another question that needs to be asked. And perhaps we're asking the wrong question. It's not just about food, but it's about the person eating the food. And one of the challenges with nutritional science to date is primarily it looks at food. As we start to look at nutrition science as a combination of looking at the patient or the person consuming the food and the effect of food on that person, we can actually build a better approach to nutrition and, uh, and nutrition therapy. And that's what we're using the microbiome for. Uh, to actually put the two things together, looking at the macro and micronutrient content of food, which classically has been studied, but then looking at its impact on a body by understanding how it's processed in the gut and results in glucose uh, production um, or not. And understanding now that the response to food is highly personalized, that we now empirically know, not as a commercial statement, but as a scientific fact, published in Cell, JAMA, Cell Metabolism, Nature, that the response to the same exact foods dosed to different people results in wildly different glucose responses. And the response to food combinations to different people that are dosed and controlled respond, results in highly different glucose responses. Tell us that one size fits all is just not the right approach to food. And it's time to upgrade the nutritional science approach and our approach to medical nutrition therapy to look at both the patient and the food together. You know, uh, the, the microbiome uh, is, is a conference in and of itself. Uh, you could have a week-long conference. In fact, there's one coming up in Paris uh, shortly uh, talking about that. And my own kind of uh, research has always been about when it comes to food and health, it's not just about the food, it's about how your body responds and put, what you put inside it. So I think that is, you know, what you said is, is incredibly important. I'd like to kind of move from, uh, uh, from this first question about, you know, how do we cure mistrust to um, how we can work together because here we have a panel where, you know, we have somebody who's actually well-informed and steeped in policy. We have somebody who's a nutrition science with, you know, an industry leader, a dominant player who really has the scale to be able to um, make big changes and globalization and a, uh, an agile um, and a new company that's actually working at the tip of the spear where the air is thin, not all the information is known, but yet it could be actually game changing. So one of the things I'd like to ask, ask as sort of the next question for each of you to respond to is, how, like, what would, from your own perspective, what is one idea that you would 
proffer uh, uh, on how the different uh, parties can actually work together in order to be able to uh, uh, move to collectively advance things, uh, move us forward. So, how, you know, we, we need evidence. We need trust. Um, we have different points of view. Everybody has their own interests in mind, different sectors, and that's totally fine. But if we had to work together, what would be one thing that you can come up with from your vantage point that could actually move everybody's um, kind of ball forward? Uh, Park, you want to take that? I, th I think that's a great question. I mean, one of the possibilities is that it's not possible to get everybody on the same page, right? And if that were to happen like that, then I think, you know, one has to teach consumers kind of the buyer beware attitude, right? That, that if there's not kind of agreement on stronger standards, you just have to learn to be cautious about claims that you hear from manufacturers in the marketplace. But the whole point of the kind of imagination of this fun panel is to imagine what would it look like if there were a possibility of some type of agreement on stronger standards. And I think history has some lessons for us about what are the constraints. Um, early in the 20th century, the, there were essentially no standards and it was a very wild marketing environment that we wouldn't really want to return to. And then later in the 1970s and 1980s, it was quite the opposite. FDA largely prohibited health claims on food labels, but this meant that innovators could not easily communicate their innovations, right? So the landmark Nutrition Labeling and Education Act in 1990 struck a compromise. And for me, this was kind of exciting because I was just starting my career as a reporter for an advocacy organization in DC in 1990. And this was one of the big things that we were covering. So the NLEA said that some claims would be allowed if they had significant scientific agreement. So that's kind of a reasonable standard that doesn't expect unrealistic, absolute proof for a scientific claim, but it disallowed the wild world of food and beverage claims that either had um, no evidence or just a little bit and partial evidence. And so you could think of this as a moderately strict standard. But this compromise was undermined, not by advocacy organizations, but largely by manufacturers who were upset about claims that they wanted to make, but were not permitted under that standard. So critics made a First Amendment argument that if there was some evidence for a claim, they should have their right as Americans to state their view on the product labels and in their advertisements. And so a series of policy decisions and legal decisions rolled back the influence of the NLEA through legislation such as the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, the Supreme Court case Pearson v. Shalala, and the expanded use of what's called structure function claims that kind of hint at a health claim, um, but without explicitly making the particular claim about a particular disease. And so if, if food and beverage manufacturers kind of wanted stronger rules, they would find ready support in academic circles and among public interest organizations. The comparatively easy part is conducting the evidence reviews that would be required. The difficult part is the policy challenge. Manufacturers might not get agreement even in their own kind of stakeholder network for really strong rules. Some manufacturers might fear government overreach or big brother. So um, lacking strong rules, I think it would lead us to fall back on the buyer beware option. I mean, um, in, until kind of that agreement comes together, I think people in research community and civil society kind of reluctantly may keep teaching consumers strong skepticism towards manufacturing mark manufacturer marketing claims that they might hear. So I just want to follow up one one point there, uh, Park, which is buyer beware. Um, I mean, I, that's true for any product, uh, whether it's a food or an automobile uh, or a home that you're actually buying. Uh, uh, so the, the idea of actually moving forward together, um, uh, are you suggesting that creating some sort of framework, some sandbox that everyone can play in, where, the, where do you see the perimeters of that being? Who sets those perimeters? I, 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 I'm not all that hopeful about it, but if it were to succeed, it would probably be something like agreement on a rule from Congress. So it would be a law from Congress that returned us pretty much to the status quo at around the time of the NLEA. So it would require significant scientific agreement. And so I think about somebody in Josh's position. Um, 
Josh might find it sometimes frustrating if, if, if a, a, a particular claim about a microbiome oriented product um, had some evidence, but didn't quite meet that standard. I think it would probably feel frustrating for somebody in, in your position, which sometimes might happen, or it might be that the claims are the sort of claim that really would meet, meet that standard of significant scientific ag agreement, where sort of the large center of the, of, the, of the research community would probably endorse the claim. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the challenge, it's a poignant challenge that we face. Well, I'm going to come to hear Josh's perspective in a second, but I, I'm particularly interested uh, in uh, Tristan. How does how do you think about this in your role uh, from a PepsiCo perspective? Um, Pepsi has been around a long time. They're doing a lot, investing in a lot of interesting research. Um, the scale of Pepsi allows you to actually do deep dives. Um, into uh, topics. And at the end of the day, you do have a serving the consumer uh, marketing uh, uh, function as a company as well. So just hearing what Park has said and, and the concerns and the consumer beware, how does a company such as PepsiCo or any big company, frankly, step forward into that sandbox in order to create a more optimistic environment? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think all industry can probably agree that, you know, we would like some boundaries. It's nice to have the regulations to set those boundaries, but innovation as well as science constantly pushes those boundaries. And so, and the regulations often lag. And so then how do you, how do you rectify that? And so I think that's really the, the times are changing now, and there is more of a need for these industry-wide standards. And you know, Park kind of alluded to this a little bit, you know, there are differences between standards and regulations, but I, I think in, in spaces that are emerging that you, uh, you know, there'll be more of a promise for in, in industry standard that has the agreement of the policymakers of, of industry, of academics in areas where you absolutely need um, consumer trust. So personalized nutrition, I mean, I'm sure Josh will speak to this as well. I mean, you have people's personal information there's there's no room for error here and so the industry and would completely collapse if any of that trust was eroded and so there is that need to have that collective agreement um, amongst all all leaders in the field uh, industry included and i think the other thing is really just to set expectations a bit so research does take time uh, we don't have all the right answers right now. Things tend to change. And so there needs to be that honest and transparency around uh, new findings, as well as, you know, what that level of impact is um, overall. If it's one animal study, it's one animal study that shouldn't change everything or tout or, or have the claims that, that go along with it. And so, especially as big industry, you know, we would love to have an even playing field um, to be able to, you know, everybody adhere to that um, higher standard of, of evidence that's required to be able to make claims on PAC and so the consumers aren't confused in, in the very um, diverse market that they're they're facing right now. Yeah, that's that's well said. Um, so Josh, you know, coming to you, you're um, working in a area that has, that's very exciting. It's got some thin air. Very clearly, you know, you're not going to get a Cochrane report on the microbiome to, you know, have all these meta-analyses and have this universal truth. And indeed, you know, these big evidence generating uh, crunching machines looking at multiple studies, to some extent, are the antithesis of individualized, personalized medicine um, <clears throat> or nutrition for that matter. And so this is a, an area that, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of debate about is, you know, how the goods of the many versus the the good of the one. Um, how do you see this like, uh, as an individual? How you, you, you can't just run and create your own sandbox. You're playing into somebody else's sandbox and there's other players as well. What does it need to look like for a company like yours to thrive? So uh, we, building on, uh, on what uh, the professor said, I'd say we would, um, we do see a lot of nonsense uh, in the microbiome space. We see a lot of what we would call fraud. And we don't mind calling it that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, good business colleagues have to be honest with each other. And if claims aren't supported with science, if science isn't peer reviewed, if the science is company sponsored only and not independent, that's another question and parameter to look at. So we made a principal decision to build all of our claims around non-company sponsored science that was peer reviewed in top tier journals and let that speak for itself. 
That's how we've approached the market on the microbiome side, believing there'd have to be a separation of the wheat from the chaff only on the peer-reviewed science alone, not on what every company can shout the loudest about from its own sponsored study. So that's how we dealt with the microbiome piece. We've also engaged the standards bodies, the, uh, the Academy of Nutrition, the uh, Endocrine Society, because we deal with diabetes and glycemia, uh, the American Academy of Clinical Endos. You know, this is the uh, um, pretty sober groups of people who won't stand with claims or science that they can't get behind from a clinical basis, and, and the ADA. And we've allowed our microbiome application for nutrition to be vetted, the science to be vetted by those bodies and to be spoken for by them and to use their references as our mouthpiece. So first with peer-reviewed independent science, second with standards bodies of clinicians as our, and the clinician licen licensing bodies as our proxies. And then whatever we say after that is mildly interesting, but typically that's what we've had to do to penetrate the market. I think that there are some, uh, predicates that we can look at in the form of organic, uh, looking at nutrition in terms of how that's been handled well or better than uh, claims have been handled in uh, other areas of nutrition. At least there are now standards around organic. While controversial, they are better than they were 10 years ago, far better than they were 20 years ago. And then when you look at structure function claims that was mentioned before, um, antioxidant, healthy, diet, uh, low calorie. There's a lot of um, unregulation on those areas. We would actually push for a combination of strong regulation for consumer advocacy around language, just as we've seen advocacy around organic, starting with the state level in the obvious places like the People's Republic of California and Massachusetts. But then we could also look at uh, taking those state examples and bring them to federal standards um, using um, the collective power of groups such as this one. So we would say, let's take the high road. It's going to take 10 years, but we think that's the right way to go. Uh, you know, in the interest of time, there's just so much we could discuss. I, I, there's a question from the audience that I want to throw up for each of you to actually uh, just quickly remark on. The, the Food Labeling Modernization Act of 2021, that is a that is a real time issue. We're in the middle of it. How do you think, uh, what, what, are you, what are you seeing around you that's happening? Does it make you concerned? Does it make you optimistic? Is there, is there some, something that we need to react or respond to? Um, uh, uh, Park, why don't you start? So I'm not quite up to speed on that proposal, even, even though I'm following, following it with interest, so I can't, can't comment on it directly. But I just want to say that just as you hear this conversation, you can hear um, how how close um, in a way the three speakers are to agreement that what 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 Josh is talking not just about um, peer reviewed literature but also about kind of established austere bodies uh, evaluating the balance of evidence um, uh, it, it's pretty close to what what I also think would generate a, a much higher level of consumer trust. Great, um, Tristan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would completely agree with that statement. Um, you know, as larger companies, you know, you kind of adhere to a higher standard, right? I mean, there's a lot of litigation risk if there's not regulatory risk involved. And so, you know, you want to make sure that you are, um, have the evidence to be able to back up any claims that, that you make. And so um, I think we're all kind of in definitely in agreement that evidence needs to, to, to be first. It's, it's in these areas that are new and emerging and how do we, um, be able to um, work together and get ahead of that curve so that there isn't that misstep or consumer mistrust as, as, as one goes forward. And, and Josh, I have a question for you that came in from the audience um, that has to do with the role of nutritionists. Um, you know, um, most nutritionists are not microbiome specialists. How does, how does your group, how do, how do you guys think about the role of nutritionists, how do they collaborate with you and what you're doing? Well, I'll just offer a friendly amendment. I have been schooled by registered dietitians that I shall not call them nutritionists because that's considered a lower credential in many states. Um, but the, the RDNs that we work with and license, um, we put them through training on the science. In fact, one of the, to the prior comments around raising standards, um, we submitted our science, the, in the peer-reviewed science around the claims that we make around the IP that we have to all of the clinical bodies. 
as CME uh, credits uh, so that they, the clinicians can receive licensure credit as dietitians, um, as doctors, as nurses, as endocrinologists, as pharmacists by actually reading our science and uh, seeing the follow-up literature on our science. So making our science part of curriculum and training of how microbiome can narrowly be applied to nutrition, glycemic excursions, and glycemic control is how we've gone about uh, integrating the science basis for what we do um, with uh, the clinical field and the practice on the ground. Well, thank you for the, for the panel for you know all your comments. Uh, you know we've talked about a level playing field, accepted standards, independent validation, uh, working with uh, different groups for innovation. So I want to thank take the time to thank uh, Park Wildy, Tristan Bribois, and Josh Stevens, and the Friedman School and Katie Stebbings, of course, um, for allowing us to actually have this conversation today and. Looking forward to the rest of the program. I did it again. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Will, and thank you to all of our panelists. That was fantastic. I have to say, it's one of those moments where we have 30 minute panels, but we could have done an hour and a half in follow up questions. I'm, I'm following the questions on the live feed. There's a lot. Um, I'm thinking maybe Dari and I will be able to comment on some of those uh, at the very end at the wrap up, but there's so much engagement on this topic. Thank you to all of you in the audience. I'm seeing your questions and comments, and um, it just shows there's, there's a lot of animation and interest in this topic. So thank you so much for our panelists. That was a great exploration of this very complicated topic.